Alrighty. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Seaside Chat. I am so excited to introduce this week's speaker, Danny Bailey, who is our oil spill outreach specialist. Thank you so much for joining us. Danny, tell us more about yourself. Hi, well, thank you so much. Um, I have a very long, complicated history, uh, nothing all that exciting. Um, so I've been working for Texas Sea Grant as an oil spill outreach specialist for about a year and a half now. I started February 2020, and then, you know, as life got crazy, we moved forward. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail about my team, um, but my focus mainly is sort of ecosystems and outreach and understanding uh, their response in relation to oil spills in the Gulf, specifically Deepwater Horizon. Um, so as we get everybody on, um, I'm very casual with my seaside talk. So if you have questions as we go through, please feel free to write them in the Q&A or the chat box. And Chloe, if they pop up, just let me know. We can kind of address them as we go. And there will also be um, time for questions at the end. So whatever works for y'all. And if I start going into a subject and don't go into more detail and y'all would like to discuss more of that, please let me know. Um, I have a, a very general overview of ecosystems today, um, but I am more than happy to go into any sort of details we would like to talk about. So it looks like we've got pretty much everybody on our chat that is planning on joining us or that uh, registered. So we're going to start off with a quick poll. If y'all could just fill out our poll real quick. Tell us what you what you know or what you would like to learn. All right, we got our answers. Perfect. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to jump right on into it. There we go. Y'all see my screen okay? Perfect. Okay, so as Chloe said, I'm Danny Bailey. Uh, I'm currently located in Corpus Christi. But uh, as Texas Sea Grant, we work a little bit of everywhere throughout Texas. So first off, Sea Grant as a whole. Um, we are a 33 university-based program. So if you're near the ocean or near Great Lake, we're there to help you. Um, we have 33 university-based programs. We also participate in research grants. So we fund and work with many different programs um, to kind of understand the science that's going on throughout the state, usually related to the Gulf Coast, issues of fishermen, anything like that. We like to say whoever relies on a healthy Gulf um, for work or for fun, um, we're there to help. So we have a variety of agents and specialists uh, that we work with or that we are, and we work across uh, the state. And we like to consider ourselves sort of the conduit between groups. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but some of the groups you might work with are industries, local governments, public citizens, recreational, commercial people, um, people coming down for vacation, anyone that is interested in enjoying the Gulf, we're here to help and answer questions and make sure that uh, science and research is getting done so that we are helping you answer those questions. So we're a two-way flow of information. Um, so as a whole, we do three different things. We provide education, so it's science-based education, and we usually do it through these webinars, um, mostly during COVID, seminars, workshops, publications. Um, however, we can get our information out more easily. Uh, we coordinate a number of high school and uh, scientific quiz bowls, and then we do our best to sort of increase visibility and public understanding of our coastal and marine environments. So we've got a lot going on here. We have a lot going on with our partners. We have a lot going on in the industries. Um, and we try to find ways to educate each and every person and partner that we are dealing with in those respects. Um, outreach. So you will meet lots of our Sea Grant outreach just throughout our seaside talks or outreach specialists and agents. Um, we really focus on engaging, educating, and inspiring everyone and anyone to appreciate um, 
enjoy and help the Gulf. Um, we cover so many different topics. I can't even remember all of them, but uh, I am sort of the oil spill specialist, but we've got people in hazard resilience, fisheries, seafood, economy, hurricanes, resilience, anything, aquaculture, anything that you might have a question on, we absolutely got somebody to help you out with it. And then finally, we have a research side of things. So we support marine and coastal related research projects across the state, which means we're not only working with our Texas a and system, but we're working with a number of universities throughout the state. Um, and we're trying to provide funding and work with researchers that are answering the questions for the people who live and work on the Gulf that have those questions. So if we have you know, a question uh, about red snapper that comes into us from water by fishermen and we see that there's a problem, we try to work with a group, a team, researchers, partners, and see how, how can we answer that question? How can we get that? And once we get those results, we try to get them back to the fishermen that are asking those questions. We get them their results, and then we start the process all over again with, of course, another question. Because once you answer one, you've got, you've always got more. So as part of Texas Sea Grant, I am part of an oil spill science and outreach team. So we actually located throughout the Gulf. So I'm Danny. I'm located in Texas. And we have other specialists, Emily, who is in Louisiana, Missy, who is Alabama, and Monica, who is in Florida. We have our team supervisor, Steve, and Tara Skelton, who are both located in Mississippi. And Tara is our excellent communicator. So she gets all of our wonderful information out. So if you guys ever want more information, especially more of the information that I'm talking about today, um, please feel free to check our Facebook, um, Mississippi Alabama's Facebook, C Grant, Mississippi Alabama C Grant's Facebook, and then I will provide you with our, our team website as well. So our goal is to share this science throughout the Gulf. Um, so I said, I'm sort of the ecosystems, eco, ecological specialist, but um, Emily, Missy, Monica are all specialists in their different fields. So anything having to do with the Deepwater Horizon spill, we try to have a good base knowledge so that we can share that education throughout the Gulf. So if I can't answer your question, somebody in my team absolutely can. Um, so just a quick how we're a team, uh, the oil spill outreach team, oh, go back, um, was funded through the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So after Deepwater Horizon, um, BP gave about $500 million to this group um, and were managed by GOMA or the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. And so this is an independent research board. It funds science and outreach and it has been going for 10 years. We actually just finished up this past December. So 10 years of research, research that has been done throughout the Gulf, which is absolutely fantastic. And we've been able to learn a whole lot about a lot of different areas. Um, our main focus areas or Gomer's main focus areas were fate and transport, chemistry, environmental and wildlife, technology and people. And from that, as the Sea Grant outreach team, we kind of took each of the research projects that were being done within those groups and sort of worked to simplify them and share them with our community. So our process, as I said before, is understanding our community. What can we do to make it better? Are there questions out there? Um, is there research that will help answer those questions? If there is, we translate peer reviewed research and government reports, and we take those and we share them in multiple different ways. However, it's best to share that information back to the public um, and to the people who are asking the questions as well as the researchers. And then we start that process all over again to make sure that we did answer the questions they had. And if there are more, how can we get those answered? So it's an ongoing process and it's a, a process that we work with many different groups of people, teams, partnerships, things like that. Um, we have a number of different products that we put out. So a lot of the ones that we focus on are bulletins and fact sheets. We try to simplify the research into either a one page or an eight page fact sheet that gives you good information about questions that you might have on the oil spill and the Gulf of Mexico. We host a number of different seminar and workshops. We have some animated videos and I'll show one of those later. Um, we have lots of different resources. So I'm gonna show a few resources today um, that we have as a team 
But if you want more or want more on some of the other topics that I'm not talking about today, um, please reach out to me. We have plenty of information on all of these things. As I said, there's 10 years of research. Um, scientists have really had a chance to answer a lot of questions. Of course, not all, but answer a lot of questions um, about the environment, deep water horizon, and the imp impacts on the Gulf and humans. So happy to help out uh, sharing any resources that we might have. We've done a number of different workshops with national academies. So that was throughout the country, trying to get even more feedback and make sure that we can share this research in the best way and the most useful way as possible. Uh, and then as an outreach group, we also have science communication tips. We wanna be able to share info as easily and simply as possible to make sure that we're not um, yelling scientific jargon at people that don't wanna hear it or don't understand, don't wanna to listen to things they don't mean to. So Gomery Synthesis and Legacies, so they had a number of different topic areas that they were covering through research over the past 10 years. Now that that 10 years is complete, we are finishing up Gomery as a whole. It will be ending in December um, and we're doing some synthesis publication. So each of the areas has had sort of what we call a, a core or a, a net group that's gotten together and kind of synthesized the main points of all of these different topic areas. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about ecology and the ecosystem impact of this deep water horizon oil spill. Um, so before I get into that, deep water horizon was an oil, uh, an oil spill um, in April, 2010. And so they had oil leak from the wellhead and reached the surface as well as the depths. Um, and so that impacts your ecology, your systems, all of your environments. Um, but it doesn't just impact each one individually. It may not impact all of them individually. It may impact one, certain ones in certain ways. You may have inferences or impacts up the food chain from something smaller to something larger. Um, oil was, the oil spill was responded to in as many ways as possible to try to keep the humans, the responders and the environment as safe as we possibly could and to respond to this um, disaster in whatever way we thought was best at the time. And so there were a number of different plans to remove the oil and each of those may or may not have an effect on the systems. Um, and that depends on those systems or those habitats characteristics. So something that may impact our marsh or our near shore environment may not in impact our bottom of the ocean or benthic environment in the same way. So when we look at ecosystems, we have to understand that there's a complex relationship. There's multiple layers, uh, there's multiple habitats, uh, there's multiple food chains, and we have to think of it as, as it is, a three-dimensional environment. So it's not just one or two layers, this is a, a large interconnected system that works together. So as oil spilled, oh, that's just another example of that. When we consider um, what happens, you start the oil, um, you get individual complications, you get population effects, and you get community and ecosystem effects. And while that may go sort of straight up the middle of that chain, it is also connected throughout that system. So even it can go off to fishermen, it can go off to our economies, it can go off to the things that those things eat, it can change habitats and forms. So just another a visualization of we're all interconnected in this system and it's important to consider all of those different factors. Um, this is an even more complicated version of that. If you really wanna think about all of the different factors that go into things, we've got many, many, different impacts naturally that are going into our Gulf system, as well as um, events like the Deepwater Horizon where oil comes in and it adds yet another um, influence or impact or change to this system. Uh, and it's important to consider each and every aspect and how you're going to look at it. Um, so this is a little complicated. Don't feel like you gotta pull all of that in, but just remember you've got lots of different layers going on. So we think about the near shore and the marsh area habitat. Um, it's sort of what we call generally a low 
energy area. So if you get oil into that habitat, um, it's going to stick. It's going to stay for a while. Um, it's very hard to clean. Imagine stomping through the marsh and trying to wash it out. You've got mud, you've got grasses, you've got all kinds of animals. It's also an area as a or nursery habitat. Um, so if it becomes impacted with oil or when it's impacted with oil, you have a chance of influencing that young generation. So if you influence your younger generation of shrimp or crabs or fish, um, that impact is going to lead all the way up the food chain. It's going to go from babies to young to adults. Um, and it may even change sort of the population size of things later on. So a marsh is something that we really strove to protect during the deep water horizon. It was a very important um, and very diverse environment. So there's a lot, a lot of um, animals, birds, creatures, crab, shrimp, fish, turtles, seabirds, everybody that's living there and using this environment. So an impact to it um, makes a large impact throughout um, your habitat, as well as that connection throughout the ocean. So if we move from near shore and shore lengths, I just want to briefly talk about sort of surface and or open ocean layers. Um, the very basic thing, or I guess smallest thing to start with is sort of a bacterial and viruses and phytoplankton and zooplankton, which are your tiny itty bitty floating creatures throughout uh, the water column. And they really rely on sunlight and or other smaller organisms to live and breathe and grow and survive. But then they are the base of the food chain. Um, from them, everyone else feeds on them and grows bigger and everybody else feeds on them and moves up. So these little guys are incredibly important when we consider an ecosystem change or a disturbance like an oil spill to this um, system because how these guys handle it and how these guys change is gonna have an overarching impact on pretty much everybody else. Um, so during the oil spill, we did see some changes. Uh, there were overall changes in the types of plankton. So where we may usually have, let's say, A, B, C types of plankton, we, the oil um, impacted that and we switched sort of to C, D, E types of plankton. Um, but the overall amount of plankton that was there didn't change. So we still had the same amount of plankton. We just ended up having different species of plankton. So there was some, some changes to that. Um, there are a number of bacteria and viruses or bacteria and microbes that actually can work on breaking down the oil. So they're naturally found because there's oil naturally in the Gulf. Um, but when there's a large influx from a spill like this, um, that bacteria and those microbes are going to take advantage of that and they're going to increase their population to work to eat up all of that for them, extra food, extra oil, extra food. So they start breaking that down. So that's a good way to start looking at the environment is from the itty bitties up to the bigger animals. Um, so if we look sort of offshore, what we call our pelagic environment, so it's more of our um, coastal deeper water to completely offshore and just wide open blue ocean. A lot of what we look at with this is our sea turtles, our dolphins, our larger uh, recreational and commercially important species um, and how each of these are impacted. Uh, more than happy to get into detail. Um, if anyone has any questions on this, I guess I should check, um, take a quick break. Chloe, do we have any questions in our chat yet? Not that I can see. Okay, perfect. And I will keep going. Um, if y'all have any questions on the specifics or want to get into any of those details, please let me know. Um, we've got lots of resources, sea turtles, dolphins, fisheries, anything like that. Um, and we have more of those synthesis publications coming out as well this next year. Um, but each of them were impacted slightly differently. So we, we saw some damage with, well, you know what? We've got this planned out because I'm just gonna show you this video and it will tell you a little bit more about the fish. And then if we're interested in talking about a little bit more details um, or dolphins and the effects on sea turtles, I will be happy to. So I'm gonna play, if you can't hear the video, will you tell me, Chloe? I'm 
I don't hear anything, but I can see it. You can see it, but can't hear it. Okay. So what I can do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick so I can switch my screen sharing mode. Now, if I optimize it for sound, let's go computer. Oh. How about now? Some animals, like fish, can break down and eliminate the compounds found in oil from their bodies. How does this happen? When a fish encounters oil, its body activates genes that help cope with the exposure. The activation of these genes triggers a chain reaction of processes in the liver and other organs, breaking down and removing oil-based compounds from the body. This ability is present not only in fish, but humans and other vertebrates as well. Every species has a unique set of behaviors that also come into play. For example, golden tilefish naturally burrow into offshore sediments. If the sediments contain oil, it triggers the fish's oil breakdown mechanisms. Additionally, the burrowing behavior tends to expose golden tilefish to more oil than fish that do not burrow into sediments. Scientists find that even though a fish's body can break down oil, the chemicals the oil breaks down into can still have negative impacts on the fish. The level of oil exposure may also be so high that it overwhelms the fish's ability to cope. For example, Gulf killifish, raised in water containing sediments from heavily oiled marshes, have lower rates of survival and less success hatching than their unexposed counterparts. Oil-exposed fish also have lower heart rates and smaller body sizes. Similarly, exposure to small amounts of oil in the lab, even for brief periods, negatively impacts the swimming ability of young mahi-mahi as they age. Though a specific cause could not be pinpointed, Scientists found that skin lesions in wild game fish, like red snapper, were correlated with oil exposure for a short time after the Deepwater Horizon spill. There are many factors at play in the environment, making things less straightforward than in the lab. Because of this, scientists continue to use a combination of lab and field studies to understand how findings in individual fish translate to wild populations and communities of aquatic life. PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, so that gives a brief overview of sort of some things that the fish uh, had to deal with, but that they're just one group. So keep in mind, we've got sh shrimp, squid, oysters, sea turtles, dolphins, whales, excuse me, all sorts of different creatures that are also pulling oil and dealing with oil in multiple different ways, whether it's easy or sometimes easy to clear that oil out of the system or if they're being highly affected by it. Um, so we've seen a number of different changes throughout that um, or throughout that area of the ocean um, related to oil. Um, and then the last area I'm gonna talk about is what we call the benthic community or the bottom of the ocean, sort of the surface of the sand way down deep. Um, and we have a variety of different creatures that live down there. It can often be cold and dark. Um, that cool temperature and lack of sunlight can also lead to things degrading or breaking down at a slower rate. Um, so some of the oil, whether it started straight from the wellhead or actually sank back down from the surface to the bottom, um, did end up in our benthic or bottom of the ocean communities. So it may have settled on coral, which caused some damage. Um, it may have ended up in the sediments, as you saw in the video with tilefish. Um, the creatures that are within or digging in or burrowing into these sediments may then encounter uh, this oil that has ended up on the bottom or ended up deep buried within those sediments. So there's a mixture of things that each of these communities is dealing with and recovering from uh, and handling as they go through uh, their recovery period or there's this 10 years afterwards. Um, as I said before, research has been done on each and every one of these 
um, questions that researchers have had in each of the different ecosystems we've talked about. Um, it's hard to compare our laboratory work to real life situations. We can try to get as close as possible um, in order to better understand how each of these ecosystems was affected and then ultimately interacts with each other and what that means for the populations. Um, but it is definitely hard to get a clear cut answer um, and often leads to more questions. So a lot of that research can be answered in our synthesis information and I'm more than happy to take questions and talk about it. Um, after 10 years of all of this research that has happened, we finally have a publication to share a good overview of everything that's happened. It is a special edition of the Oceanography Magazine. It is just came out at the very beginning of this week. It is 10 years of oil spill and ecosystem science. Um, the ecosystem ecological part is just one chapter in this magazine. So if you are interested in modeling and chemistry, effective dispersants, any of those related oceanography topics, things like that, um, there's a good overview that comes out in this magazine or in this journal copy. Um, that really covers, in short, a lot of the, the 10 years of research that, that was able to be accomplished through GOMRI or the Gulf of, Me Re Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Um, I can't stress enough that there are hundreds of researchers that have worked internationally over these 10 years to understand and comprehend and sort of puzzle together the information that we've learned um, from this whole event and disaster um, for, about the deep water horizon and from it and the impacts. Um, so with that, I'm gonna start you off with our basic resources um, as a, oil spill science and outreach team. We have our own web pages. A video you watched is actually produced by Emily, one of our um, specialists. So we have a variety of videos. We have um, past seminars that we've recorded. So very similar to this, if you have a topic that you'd like to get a little bit more detail on, um, we take the experts and we break down that information. Um, and we have discussions just like this with audience members so that you can fully understand the details of each of the topics. Um, so all of that is on our webpage as well as our publications um, and our fact sheets. If you are interested or need any of those fact sheets or uh, bulletins in physical copy, please let me know. Uh, we'll send them to you for free. Um, we've got a whole range of things to cover or topics to cover and ideas and questions that we've received from the community and reached out and made um, material from that. Uh, if our site can't help you, um, we're funded by Gomri and Gomri Research has been the ones that have been doing these 10 years of research. Um, they really have asked some hard hitting questions and gotten some very great uh, research results from all of it. So they have, um, just a plethora of information on their website as well. If you need help navigating any of these, please reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help. Um, and also within Gomri, there were the each different topics and sections um, or consortia that worked on each of those things. So if you look on the consortia tab, you can also get um, some more information. And as an ocean nerd, uh, there are some very, very beautiful and cool pictures to just check out and see how the environment has was impacted and has changed. Um, there was a group that explored sort of the deep sea, and they have some beautiful pictures of these. I mean, they're not monsters, but cool looking, creepy guys from way deep down in the ocean. Um, so I am happy to take any questions that anyone might have. And while everyone, while y'all think about your questions, I'm going to send out our second set of polls. So if y'all wouldn't mind filling that out, I would really appreciate it. Here it comes.
Awesome. Thanks, you guys. And Danny, I see you have a question in the Q&A box. Can you see it or do you want me to read it to you? Uh, could you read it to me? Absolutely. It is, um, here we go. <clears throat> Alexis asks, um, did Gulf residents have to avoid eating certain types of seafood after the spill to avoid consuming oil contaminated fish? If so, do we know if those species are generally safe to eat now since it's been 10 years since the spill or is there still a risk? That is an absolutely fantastic question. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, so initially that was a fear by a lot of people living along the coast um, and many tests were done by the FDA as well as other institutions and organizations to test and make sure that no components of dispersants or oils were above a level that were safe to eat. Uh, they did not at any point find that there was any danger for eating that seafood. Um, there was a short period of fisheries closures, but that was just sort of to make sure that we weren't collecting of those, any of those fish that may have been too highly contaminated. But no, there was no concern um, to eating any of the fish then or now. So please support, support your Gulf fisheries, uh, keep it sustainable, but definitely eat up those oysters and redfish and seaweed and, and anything else, you're, you're safe. Um, and the water quality is, is continued to be monitored um, since then and will continue to be monitored throughout then or throughout our next futures and the future of the Gulf. So if there's any concern of eating things, please check back with um, Sea Grant or your, your local environmental quality group, but you're pretty, pretty safe. You're very safe for eating all the seafood and make sure that there's, there's no damage um, to them or will be passed on to you. So your seafood is healthy and ready for you when you're hungry. That was a good question. Um, we have another one. Okay, it is, question. have the dolphin and turtle populations recovered? Have the dolphin and turtle populations recovered? I'm gonna start with the turtles. Uh, the turtles have bounced back better than the dolphins have. Um, they were certainly affected. Um, with some of the damages in the population decreased a bit, um, but they have had a number of other influences that weren't just from oil. So it may be a combination of all of those things or not um, that go into the turtles, um, but the turtles are, are steadily climbing back. Uh, our dolphins, however, have suffered a lot of damage. Um, they're very similar to us in sort of how their system works biologically um, and they have had a very tough time with the toxicology or the, the oil components um, in recovering. And so uh, there's been some damages to those populations and they are, but because dolphins are like us in the sense that they have sort of long lived life cycles, there's their young grow up, take a little while to mature, then they get older, then they can have young. Um, so it will take longer for a population that um, is longer lived like dolphins um, to recover from something like this. So um, it's a slow process. It's hard to measure completely, but there's a group in uh, Baffin Bay, Louisiana, that's been doing a really good job of just generally checking up on their population and seeing how things have changed. Um, they dealt with some challenges. Um, they're, they're trying to recover. Um, but there's multiple different factors in, in having new baby dolphins and making sure that the dolphins stay healthy with these components that are um, in oil or in dispersants or the combination of both um, that has been very challenging to dolphins. So they're not quite recovered. I don't wanna say anything completely certain, but I think they're slightly better, but they're definitely um, still struggling to recover. Great question. Does anyone else have a question? I'll give everyone a couple right. of minutes. Oh, I know we're, I guess we're good. Yeah, this was such okay. a cool well, Yeah, if you've got questions, keep thinking. I've got. I'll give it a few more minutes just in case someone's typing. <laughs> Okay, yeah, sure. Well, while you are typing and typing your questions, I'm going to give a little shout out to our Texas Sea Grant group. We are celebrating 50 years as Texas Sea Grant uh, an anniversary. 
And we ha actually have an exhibit that is coming up. We are waiting to hear when you'll be able to see it in person. So keep an eye on our Facebook um, and social media accounts for when it will be open. But there is a exhibit that our lovely communicator has set up that will be ready to go as soon as they say we're comfortable with the health and safety of everything in the uh, George Bush Presidential Library, which is in College Station. Um, and we would love to have y'all join us, come check it out. Um, and we'll be posting information. We have posted some of, our, some of our history, but we'll be posting more information on when that exhibit will be open um, and when it will uh, be ready for viewing and we'll share all of our excitement as our 50th anniversary this year. Um, finally, as some of you guys asked, we always have questions. Um, those were two of our, or two or three of our top main questions you guys actually asked. Um, so we have bulletins that cover those things. Um, so one of them being the top five frequently asked questions about Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, but we also have a variety of the other thing or other topics. So we've got fisheries related. We've got how did it affect corals? How did it affect oysters? A little bit more about skin lesions. We have dolphins, sea turtles, um, and how it related to the fisheries landings and the fisheries community. So these are all publications that are already out. Um, they're online and we're happy to share those with everyone. And again, if you would like um, hard copies in person, please just let me know and I can send you however many you need. Um, so with that, I think that's everything I have. Does anyone else have any questions or any other topics they would like to talk about? I'm more than happy to go into um, greater detail on some of the things. You have another question in the Q&A and in the chat box, so I can read you the Q&A oh, right. if you'd like. Okay, sure, um, bring it on. I'll stop sharing my screen. Donna asks, how many state shores were impacted by the spill? Any state shores? That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say all of them. All five of them, I believe, had, had impacts on the shoreline. Maybe not Texas as much as the other ones. Um, and it may have been delayed. So there, that response may have happened immediately or it may have happened later. Um, Louisiana was definitely the hardest hit. Uh, their marshes and their shoreline areas um, were the most impacted. Uh, as responders responded to the oil spill, they did their best to sort of disperse the oil, use booms, soak it up however they could to kind of keep oil away from those important shoreline habitats. Um, but it, it, does, it does come ashore, unfortunately. Um, uh, we actually have an outreach publication on the beaches and how the beaches are sort of their own system of, of breathing and turning over and recovering from that. Uh, I don't know the, the details of all of that. That kind of gets into a little bit more of our, our physical chemistry. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, send out that information about how the beaches have recovered. Um, there, there's been a lot of restoration projects that NOAA has funded throughout uh, the 10 years and continues to fund making sure that our beaches and our coastlines are getting um, the help they need in recovering the best way possible. And we have another one in the Q&A box. Um, did you see any lingering effects of mitigation where the response method actually made things worse? Oh, that's always the tough question, right? Um, so it's hard to say yes or no to that um, because this is sort of the largest impact um, that we have ever seen before. And so it was a oh no, I spilled my coffee next to my laptop. We've got to try to protect everything as best we can immediately and as quickly as we can in the ways that we think will work. Um, and then sort of pick up the pieces afterwards and see. Um, so in a lot of cases, yes, absolutely collected oil and it, and it was able to help. Um, in some cases, it's been seen in some laboratory studies, let me clarify this, some laboratory studies um, that have used sort of 10 or more times the amount that was seen ever in nature 
um, they found that there were some effects, but those were effects that weren't naturally seen in the Gulf. So we know that there are possibilities of, of toxic and damaging effects of some of the mitigation impacts or mitigation measures, um, but some of them or a lot of them that were tested weren't tested at natural conditions. So it's very hard for us to compare sort of your, your beaker sized experiments with our natural variations of the ocean. Um, so we know a little bit more about sort of species specific impacts and things like that, but we don't completely understand the full ecosystem population effect to that. So. Yes, yes and no, you know, it's sort of do no harm. Um, so we're not gonna make it worse. We're gonna take um, the best of a worse situation and, and do with it what we can. Awesome, um, do you see there is a question in the chat? Can you see that one or do you want me to read it to you? I think I can see that one. Um, okay, so our question from Stephanie. So what have you seen in coral populations and in near shore environments? What work has been done with a focus on coral, especially compounded with climate change and seawater temperature? Whew, you guys are asking the good questions. Um, so there has been some effects to coral. I don't know specifically um, what effects have been done compounding with climate change and seawater temperature. Uh, corals are very sensitive creatures. Um, so as they were, if they were impacted by sort of the oil material that floated down or covered them, um, if there was an ocean current and or disturbance like a hurricane that was able to clean them off quickly, they have coral that is, is fine and recovering. Um, areas where the coral was damaged, um, it's going to take a very long time for them to recover. They're, they're slow growing animals. Um, our coral that is in uh, deep sea corals um, were impacted by some sedimentation or some oil settling on them and they're incredibly slow growing. Um, so those are gonna take about 10 to 30 years to completely recover um, from that. I, I'm sure that's compounded um, by climate change and water temperature, um, but I do not know the details of that. So I will have to get uh, send you some, some more answers on that one. Hello. All right. We have Do we have more. any more? We have one more in one the more? Q All right. Can you read that? Or what do we got? It? Could you read it? Yes. It says, did the dis disperance have a negative effect on fish? Uh, so I'm going to sound like a broken record. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the, the videos we watched said there are some species that are able to process some of the damaging chemicals, um, but it depends sort of on what life stage you're at. So if you're a baby larval fish uh, that can't move out of the way of the oil, um, there may be some toxic effects from that oil and or dispersant and or the mixture of both. Um, if you're a larger fish that is able to sort of swim and remove yourself from that area, you may be able to process sort of the leftovers that are in your system and get rid of them and have no effects. Um, so it really depends on the fish, its lifestyle and the habitat it's living in. Uh, things like tile fish that will bury into the sediment, they're gonna have that opportunity to be more exposed to oil and oil in the water and then oil in the sediment so they may have um, they have some mechanisms to help them, um, but it, it may just overload their system as well. Mahi-mahi, um, it was seen that there were some damages to younger juveniles. Um, but when you think about it, or I guess as you think about it, um, they're itty bitty baby fish floating around. They can't avoid that oil and they are um, very exposed to everything that's flowing around them. So. Uh, some species are definitely impacted, but overall, uh, the fisheries has rebounded better than it was in 2010. Uh, we're not sure all of the answers to all of those factors. Like I said, ecosystems are very complex things. Um, so you've got factors coming in at, at every angle, but um, our fisheries are, are doing well. Um, we've got more than we had in 2010 uh, overall. So if there's a specific species, um, it's good to just look into that if you're interested in that. But 
Um, overall, there was an impact, but nothing 10 years hasn't been able for the environment to naturally bounce back from. Awesome, you guys had some really great questions this week. I feel like I learned so much. This is great. That was great. You guys are you guys are really thinking hard about this, and uh, I, I definitely will answer what I can. But please, I'd I'd love to refer you to more of our references, our, our bulletins, our fact sheets. Um, they go into much greater detail and really cover the full the full aspect of all of your questions as well. Awesome. Well, if nobody else has any more questions, I guess this concludes this week's Seaside Chat. Thanks again, Danny, for coming. This was great. I loved it so much. And I hope our audience did too. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming, you guys. And I hope you all will join us um, next week, next two, in the next two weeks for our next Seaside Chat. It's going to be great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day, all. Bye, everyone.